CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The soul is imperishable, and so is its every fragment. Every delight makes its mark upon it. Every show of love colors it. Each pleasure leaves an impression. Likewise, all wounds, all shocks, even small cuts, scratches, and abrasions, all are preserved in the cracks and crannies of the human spirit. The story we're about to bring you is the story of one woman's spirit and its hidden places. Just for a second there, I thought I saw him. Who? He was swimming toward me. Who was it you saw? Larry? Or was it John? Which? Or was it somebody else entirely? Who was it? mystery drama Silent Shock was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour allergy capsule, and True Value hardware stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. tiniest fraction of a life is lost completely. No slightest sensation, no vagrant thought, no dart of feeling, no flutter of desire dies until the life is finished forever. And for all we know, not even then. Listen now to the story called Silent Shock. Oh, yes. I was so right to take this place. I can see the ocean from every window. The ageless, the indifferent sea. Who wrote that? Somebody. The crashing of the waves on the shore. Like tumbrils ricketing down old cobblestones. Hey there, that's not a bad line. Where's my notebook? Okay. And pencil. Now, waves like ancient... Tumbrils. Oh, no. It's no good. I can't. I can't unpack my heart with words. That's Shakespeare, I think. Yes, from Hamlet. Well, why can't I write things like that? Unpack my heart with words. I'll never write a line that I can stomach. Oh, Lord, I'm stifling. <coughs> I'm choking. I need air. See air. There. Ah, there. Oh, wash me clean. Fill my lungs. Cleanse my soul. Yes. There. Strongly it bears him along in swelling and limitless billows. Nothing before and nothing behind but the sky and the ocean. Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He wrote that. Oh, yes. This is the place where I can think things through, get it all straight in my head, get it all together. Isn't that what the young people say these days? Something like that, anyhow. If I were young, that's what I'd be saying. Do they know they're very young? That 30 years later, they'll still be trying to get it all together. Better they don't know, or they give it up, because the struggle will grow tougher and harder, and they will grow weaker and wearier. Entree? Avanti? Come in. Oh, Mrs. Denham. Just thought I'd see if there's anything you need, Mrs. Gunther. Nothing, not a thing. Go to your thing. Will you want a dress for dinner? Why should I? I've ordered fresh asparagus. Vinaigrette? Oh, then I really should dress, shouldn't I? Please yourself. Pale green, do you think? For the asparagus? Or a print for the vinaigrette? Whatever you say. No. 
Mrs. Denham, no. I think I'll have dinner up here. You're sure? If you have another of those charming little pink capsules. I brought you one. Oh, aren't you thoughtful? I'll get you a glass of water. Oh, Mrs. Denham? Yes, Mrs. Gussie. Just how much am I paying you? What's that? How much am I paying you? Here's your water. And here's your little pink pill. Oh, thank you. Now, you're sure you don't want to dress and come down for dinner? No. No, I think I'll take a tiny nap. And then when I wake up, I'll make a few phone calls. Whatever you say. You're very good to me, Miss Denham. I'm so glad you came to work for me. And I'm so glad I took this place. I'm really very happy about the whole thing. That's good. I'm glad. For once, I did something right. So often, I haven't. I'll be up after a while with your dinner. Thank you, Mrs. Denham. Thank you very much. Have a nice nap. Oh, Mrs. Denham. Yes, Mrs. Gunther? Do you mind my asking, what's your first name? It's Harriet, Mrs. Gunther. Harriet. That's a nice, dependable name. Would you mind very much if I called you Harriet? No, I don't mind. And what's the name of the yard man? Who? The yard man, the man who works around the garden, the man who cleans the beach and drives the station wagon and all that. Oh, I believe his name is Casper. Casper Royce. Casper. Not such a dependable name. Do you think? Well, I don't know. After all, it's just a name. My name's Catherine. I know. Would you call me Catherine? If you like. Sometimes I'm called Kathy. Sometimes lately, not too often. I'm called Kate. Which do you like best? To begin with, would you call me Catherine? I know it isn't strictly proper for an employer and an employee to be on first name basis, but uh, would you? Of course, if that's what you'd like. Thank you, Harriet. You're welcome, Catherine. Rest well, Catherine. Thank you, Harriet. The gaudy, blabbing, and resourceful day is crept into the bosom of the sea. Yes? Hello? Larry? It's me. It's Kate. Oh. Oh, yes. Yes, where I am. Where? The most beautiful place you ever saw. Right by the ocean. I can see it from my window. Must be beautiful. And hear it day and night. You want to hear it? I'll, I'll take the phone over to the window. There. You hear it? <laughs> do you hear it? Yes, I do. It must be quite a place where you are. Oh, it is. It is. It's terribly expensive, but who cares? Not me, I assure you. Uh, Larry? Yes, Kate? Do you miss me? Oh, say you do, even if you don't say that you do. I need to hear you say it in the worst way. Larry, are you there? I'm here, yes. You're not still brooding over that little quarrel we had, are you? Which one was that? The last one, of course, when you stormed out of the motel. Oh, uh, that one. And you called me all those things. What things? You know what things. No, I don't. What things? Oh, you couldn't have forgotten already. What things, Kate? Oh, possessive, demanding, you know. Oh, those things. And worse things, too. Insatiable, stifling. You said I drew a circle around you and I wouldn't let you step across the line. Is that what I said? And, and, and when I begged you to come back and told you I'd try to do better, you said, too late, the boat has sailed. Are you there? Kate? I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Are you all right? I'm fine. I'm perfectly fine. Never better. Larry, you know what I think would be nice? The nicest thing I can think of? What's that? For you to come here. It's such a beautiful place. But with the sea and the sun, and it's a lovely house. And I have aquamarine sheets on my bed. And a chaise long draped in Chantilly lace. <laughs> Aren't you tempted? Kate. We could fall in love all over again. I know that we will. And, and we'll take long walks by the sea and breathe the good air and skip stones. Remember how good you always were at that and I could never learn how. Well, I'll practice. And when you get here... I have to hang up now, Kate. 
Oh, do you? I really do. Well, I'll call you again soon. And you think about coming up here for a visit. Will you do that? I'll think about it. And I'll start collecting stones. Where's the skip? Nice, flat one. All right. Goodbye for now, Kate. Does that mean you'll come? Oh, you hung up. Well, I guess I said everything I had to say. After all, what is there to say to someone who was once your lover and isn't anymore? And when she took unto herself a mate, she must espouse the everlasting sea. Hello? John, is that you? Hello? This is Kathy, John. Oh, Kathy. How are you, Kathy? Fine. Fine. I'm just fine. That's good. How are you? Fine. John, have you forgiven me? For what, Kathy? Well, for running off with Larry. Oh. I was such a fool. John, I'd like to come back. Would you take me back? I know it's a lot to ask after what I did, but, John, I'll be ever so good this time if you'll just take me back. It'll all be like it was before. Remember when we first got married? Remember how sweet it was? Well, it could all be like that again if you just give me another chance. Kathy. John, listen. I'll tell you what. Why don't you come up here and we'll talk about it? I've rented the loveliest place right on the ocean. Say you'll come. I'll try, Kathy. You'll do it if you love me. Do you, John? Do you love me at all? Oh, Well, what can you expect from a cast-off husband? Not much, I guess. Father, be there, please. Be there, oh, Father. Daddy, answer the phone. Daddy, please. Papa. Oh, Papa. Oh, Papa, please. Please, Papa. There's more asparagus. I'll have some. She asked me to call her by her first name. Well, that's all right. She wanted to call me Harriet. I said, fine, sure. Go ahead. No harm in it. That's what I figured. One thing bothers me. What's that? The telephone. I'd uh, like to take it out. She doesn't use it much. Yeah, but uh, when she does... uh... It bothers you? Well, it's not that it bothers me. It's just that I can't be absolutely sure of answering it myself. No, I suppose you can't. And I can't trust anybody else to answer it. You know what I mean. that pass in the night and speak to each other in passing. Only a signal shown and a distant voice in the darkness. So on the ocean of life we pass and speak one another. Only a look and a voice. Then darkness again and silence. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. you were introduced to three people inside a house and two voices on a telephone. Between those inside and those outside, all during our intermission, the implacable sea has never ceased to throb. Listen now to the second act of Silent Shock. La, 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 la. Morning, Mrs. Gunter. Oh, oh. Hey. Nice morning. Uh, are you Casper? Casper Royce. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you don't remember me, do you, from before? Before what? Oh, never mind. Just before. I'll be perfectly frank with you, Casper. I don't even remember hiring you. But I guess I did. Yes, ma'am. Well, what you got there? This? Oh, this. 
It's just a pile of stones. Flat stones. Stones for skipping. You know, like this. Only, <laughs> I can't do it. All right. It's on the way. Hold it. I used to know somebody who could do it. I thought he might be coming to see me. That's why I collected all these stones. Well, I see somebody coming down the beach. You think, Mary? I don't know. It could be, I guess. Well, I'd better get on with my work. You're doing a very good job here, Casper. I wish to commend you for it. All right, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Hello. How are you? Hello, Larry. You mind if I sit down? If you want to. Oh, I do. Then by all means do. That's quite a pile of stones you've got there. Why did you come here, Larry? Didn't you want me to? More than anything. That's what I thought. Only... Only... Only what? Now that you're here, I don't want you here. Why is that? Because... Because I don't love you anymore. You don't? Not at all. Not a bit. Why is that, do you think? Why is anything... Foolishness to think there's a why to anything. A brain could burst and spill all over trying to figure out why. Don't you know that? Everybody asks questions, nobody gives answers, and there you have the whole thing in a nutshell. In a seashell, perhaps I should say. That's why I hate it. I hate it. Hate what? The ocean. The damned ocean. I thought you loved the ocean, kid. Well, I don't. What's that poem? What are the lines? I have no memory anymore, and my memory used to be the best thing I had. Now I can't remember anything. Oh, yes. An ocean is forever asking questions and writing them aloud along the shore. That's true. That's so true. And I walk along this shore looking for questions. You know the story about Gertrude Stein? Don't you, Kate? When she was dying, she said to her companion, What's the answer? And when her companion shook her head, Miss Stein said, All right, then. What's the question? Oh, that's good. That's very good. That's very, very good. I didn't know you knew things like that, Larry. You amaze me. Do I? You can go away now. You've given me something to think about. All right. And I'm going inside. Away from this damned hateful sea! Any progress? I think so. Some. She came in for lunch. Where is she now? Back on the beach again. Hmm. Can't stay away. Tell me something. Do you really think it's worth it? Oh, yes. Definitely. Yes. Taking such a long time, such a lot of work. That's all right. And lately such expense. Never mind. It's all going to be worth it. The rewards will be tremendous. So just hang in there, Harriet. Afternoon, Mrs. Gunther. Oh, Casper. Hello. Yeah, she's still calm. Good for skipping stones. Oh, I don't care about those anymore. You want me to clear them away? No, leave them. The sea will take them eventually. The sea takes everything eventually, so just leave them there. You uh, enjoy wading in the ocean? I like it. Anyway, it's something to do. You ever go swimming? Oh, no. No, I can't swim. Nobody ever taught me. Not hard to learn. Not if you're young, maybe. I didn't learn till I was 50. <laughs> and I'm pretty good at it. Really? You mean that? Oh, I could probably teach you if you'd care to try. I don't know. I'm afraid of the ocean. Nice calm day like this one. Nothing to be afraid of. It's funny, just this morning, I thought I hated the ocean. But I can't stay away from it. Don't you think that's peculiar? Ooh, I don't know what it is. Do you know Lord Byron's poems? <laughs> I don't know any lords. And I don't know much about poetry either. Lord Byron was an Englishman, 18th century. His real name was George Noble Gordon. Uh, what's the poem? And I have loved the ocean, and my joy of youthful sports was on thy breast to be born like the bubbles onward. From a boy I wantoned with thy breakers and trusted to thy billows far and near. 
and laid my hand upon thy mane, as I do here. Eh? That's very nice. And laid my hand upon thy mane. Imagine writing that. Imagine seeing the ocean like a great imperious lion, so regal, so indifferent, so... Imagine being so talented you could see that and write it down. Oh, Lord! Uh, you are right, Mrs. Gunter. Why can't I write something like that? It isn't fair. It isn't right. What's the matter with me? Nothing's the matter with you, Mrs. Gunther. I didn't mean to upset you, Casper. You didn't upset me. You upset yourself. Well, whatever. You go on about your work. I'll play around in the water for a while longer. All right, Mrs. Gunther. Don't go out where it's too deep. I won't. Don't worry. I'm trusted to thy billows far and near and lay my hand upon thy name as I do with you. Hello. Hello. What do you want? Just to talk to you, that's all. I don't know what we have to say to each other, John. I thought there might be something. I thought there might be two when I called you, but now I don't think there's anything. What made you change your mind? The way I've been feeling lately. Tell me about it, Catherine. Don't you dare call me Catherine. Don't you dare. You never called me Catherine, never, so don't start now. I'm sorry. I have never given you permission to call me Catherine, never. Kathy, that's okay, that's all right, but never Catherine. Is that understood, John? I said I was sorry, Kathy. There's a fog rising, I think. Yes, it looks that way. Maybe we should go inside. Pretty soon the foghorn will start up. Do you see what I see? I don't know. What do you see, Kathy? A ship. A big ship. I don't see any ship. You never saw any of the things that I saw. What do you mean by that, Kathy? It's terrible to see things that other people don't see. Yes, I can imagine. Yes, it is a ship. A big white ship. Far out. Way far out. I don't see it. The fog, probably. I can see it through the fog. That's the difference between you and me. I can see through fog and you can. You only see what's right in front of your face. Yes, you could be right. Partly right, anyway. I am completely right. Well, maybe I'd better leave, Captain. Maybe you'd better. In fact, I'm sure you'd better. She's still out there. I know she is, Harriet. I thought she'd come in for dinner. Couldn't I go get her? Leave her alone. It'll be dark in a few minutes. It's getting chilly. There's a fog coming up. Don't you think No, so? I do not think. Just leave her alone. I hope you know what you're doing. I hope so, too. Because she certainly doesn't know what she's doing. I don't be too sure of that. You mean she does? In a way. In a way. Just leave her alone. <laughs> through the fog. It's there. It's there. I only have to wait. It'll come closer. The fog will lift. At the very least, the fog will part. And I'll see it big and white and powerful and majestic. Sailing strong, serene on the breast of the sea. It's closer. Coming closer. I've only to wait in a room. Yes. Yes. It's coming in. It's coming into me. It's coming straight to me. To my arms. Straight to my arms. Oh, beautiful. Father, I'm here. I'm here. Father, I'm right here. She's standing up. Oh, 
about her? I can just barely see her. It's almost dark, the fog. She's waiting for something. For what? She knows. Do you know? I think so. Well, then... It's no good my knowing. She has to know. Oh, now she's stretching her arms out to the side. Oh? She's moving, taking a few steps toward the water. Oh. She's going into the water. Let her. No, I won't. I'm going to stop her. Let her alone, I'm going to open the window and call to her. At least I can do that. Mrs. Gunther? Mrs. Gunther? Leave her alone. She's walking too far out. Father! It's me! It's me! Daddy! Mrs. Gunther, stop! Come back! Papa! It's Daddy! We can't let her drown. Papa! I'm going to stop her if you want. I know you're not. It is wrong. It's Daddy, Papa! I'm here! She's over her head. She is. I can't stand it. I can't. Wait. Be quiet. It's all right. I've got her. Hi, Doctor! Hi, Doctor! Doctor! It's all right! Probably no writer in English knew the sea better than Joseph Conrad. Yet, these are his words. The sea never changes. And its works, for all the talk of men, are wrapped in mystery. We shall return presently with the final act of Silent Shock. When we left you at the close of our second act, it is with some words of Joseph Conrad. As we begin the final act of our drama, we think it fitting to quote the great Polish writer again. I have known the sea too long... To believe in its respect for decency. Yes. Come in. Oh. Hello, doctor. How are you feeling? All right, I think. Strange. But I'm all right. No cold or sniffles or anything like that? Should I have? Well, you weren't in the water very long. Casper pulled you out. Oh, yes, Casper. Imagine I didn't used to think I could trust him. Awful of me. Tell me about feeling strange. Well, I, I, I feel as though I've been through a lot. Well, that's very true. You have been through a lot. Did Larry come here? Did I see Larry? In a way, you did. And John, did he come here? And did I see him? In a way, yes. What happened to them? You sent them away. But I asked them to come. Why would I send them away? Once they got here, you found you had nothing to say to them. They weren't really here, were they? Not really. Well, that all depends on what you mean by really. You mean it's all in my mind? That's silly, Doctor. That's not so silly as you might think. Mrs. Gunther, I have something to tell you. It may come as a surprise, even a shock, but I have to tell you. Your father is here. My father? He didn't let us know he was coming. He simply showed up at the house this morning quite unexpectedly. He came on the boat last night? No. Yes, he did. He did. I was right. He was on the big white ship I saw out in the ocean. And that's why I walked into the water. He was on that big white ship. No, no, Mrs. Gunther. He came on an airplane. Are you lying to me? Have I ever lied to you? Well, there's always a first time for a lie. Not between you and me. There can be no lies between us. Do you want to see your father? Why, of course I do. Of course I do. Now, don't answer too quickly. Think about it. I don't have to think about it. I've waited, waited so long all my life. I walked into the ocean. Why wouldn't I want to see my father? All right. If you're sure. But I am sure. You'll have a little time to think about it. I don't need any time. I want to see him now. No, no. I have to talk to him first. After I've talked to him, then you can see him. All right? Oh, I guess so. He's downstairs now, waiting for me. 
When I talk to him, I'll send him up here. No, no, don't do that. No? Change your mind? I don't want to see him up here. Tell him I'll be down by the ocean. Tell him to come down there. If that's the way you want him? That's the way I want it. By the edge of the sea. Tell him I'll be waiting. I'll tell him. Oh, Mrs. Gunther, uh, you like poetry, don't you? Poetry is my passion. Then let me quote you something from Catullus. The Roman poet. Yes. Catullus wrote one of his most beautiful odes. I hate and I love. Why do I do so? Perhaps you ask. I do not know. But I feel it. And I am in torment. Where is he? He knows I'm waiting. I think he's with your daughter. He'll be here shortly. I haven't got all day. Oh, uh, you're the doctor? Uh, yes, I am. You've uh, met my wife? Yes, we've met. Please sit down. Take my chin. I'm, uh... I'm here about these bills. I've just come from your daughter's room. Yes, your wife said that's where you probably were. Wouldn't you like to know how she is? Oh, how is she? She's improved. She's all right? I didn't expect that. I didn't think she'd ever be all right. I didn't say she was all right. I said she's improved. Well, how much? Improved how much? Some. You realize, don't you, what happens if she's ever really, really all right? Yes, I do. Tell me something. How does she happen to be here? When I went to England, she was at Edgeworth Sanitarium. It wasn't until I began to get these outlandish bills of yours that I knew she'd been moved. I wrote you about that. Well, you only wrote me that the sanitarium had been closed down. And that my wife and I had taken Catherine to live with us. I was her psychiatrist at Edgeworth, and I thought she had a good chance for recovery. Complete recovery? That remains to be seen. But I thought when she came here that, that it was just a temporary thing. I... I trusted you to, to take care of everything. The other patients at Edgeworth went home to their families or institutionalized elsewhere by their families. When we looked about for Catherine's family, where were you? Well, I, I was in, in England. You know that, in, in London. I moved my business there after... Well, you know. You know everything that happened, I'm quite sure. Well, that was 15 years ago. You stayed in London for 15 years. No one's heard anything from you in all that time. Unless you call a monthly check, hearing from him. And for the last few months, we haven't even had a check. Well, because your bills got idiotically exorbitant. Look here, look at this. A thousand dollars for the services of a man named Casper Royce. There was never any charge like that when she was at Edgeworth. What could a man do to earn a thousand dollars a month? Well, for one thing, he could save your daughter's life. We brought Casper here from Edgeworth. He's a good man, and he developed a fondness for Catherine. As we had. He was assigned to keep an eye on her at all times. Last night, he rescued her from the sea. She tried to, to drown herself? She tried to find you. Oh, forgive me, Doctor. I'm not up on all this psychiatric mumbo-jumbo. I'm a simple man. Now, let I me don't... try and make it a little clearer for you. The last time your daughter saw you was from a pier in the harbor. You were on a large white ship. She waved you. I suppose you waved back. I hope you did. And the ship sailed. She never saw you again. Well, I couldn't stay here. You know that. The scandal, the publicity. I'd have, well, I'd have gone out of my mind. The way your daughter went out of hers? Well, she was already uh, unhinged. Unstable. Yes. Highly neurotic, yes. But not quite mad. At Edgeworth, she was obsessively interested in poetry of all kinds. Even tried some herself. But most especially, she was interested in poems about the sea. She copied them down, memorized them. She still does. And recites them, too. It became clearer and clearer that she was waiting for you to come back in a big white ship from across the sea. And last night, she thought she saw such a ship, and she went out to meet it. Isn't it strange that the morning after she did that, you made your appearance? Oh, I came by plane. Yes, well, that's a petty detail, don't you think? The heart of the matter is that she knew you had come back. The man she'd waited for for so long had come back. The man she'd loved all her life 
had come back. Now, Doctor, you're not trying to tell me she she sensed something, had an intuition, some kind of, of a telepathic communication. I wouldn't try to tell you anything. As you say, you're a simple man. But I wouldn't want you to think that she didn't see other men before you came. Actually, just yesterday, she saw her husband. Talk to him. Saw John? Talk to John? That's impossible. I happen to know John's in Bangkok. He got married about ten or twelve years ago. I didn't say he was here. I said she saw him. Talk to him. Well, if he wasn't here, how how could she she talk to me? She thought you were John? In psychoanalysis, the doctor's always a surrogate, a substitute, a stand-in for someone else. We never quite know how the patient sees us. If the patient ever sees us at all, as we really are, as anything but some familiar figure from the troubled past... That's the way your daughter sees me from time to time. But yesterday she saw me not only as John, once her husband, but as Larry, once her lover. Larry? Larry's dead. Yes, Larry's dead. He's been dead for 15 years. I know. She shot him. She shot him dead in the middle of a quarrel. I know all that. If she ever gets out of here, and if she's ever declared sane, good Lord, she'll have to stand trial. Do you realize that? She'll be dragged into court to stand trial for murder. I realize that. Well, you can't let that happen. I can't. Would you? Yes, I would. Peace of mind, emotional equilibrium are worth everything. Everything. I believe that. I believe it's worth every penny, every sacrifice, every effort it's worth giving one's life for. I believe that or I would not be doing what I am doing. I can't protect my patients and the other people in their lives, but I can work to protect them from themselves. And if one of them wants to walk into the ocean to meet a man, it's my duty not to just to keep her from walking too far, but to make her realize why she did such a suicidal thing. And to keep her from doing it again. Some other time, some other notion. Some other man. Well, I don't quite grasp your point of view. I realize that soon. Would you care to see your daughter? I ought to. It's entirely up to you. She wants to see you. Or is she, uh, will, will she... Will she know me? I'm inclined to think that she will. Which is her room? She's not in her room. She's on the beach. Uh, she said to, to tell you she'd talk to you there. Look, uh, look here. You can see her from the window. Is that Catherine? Has she changed so much? Well, it's been 15 years, but she she looks uh, uh, very nice. I'll go down to the beach and talk to her for a few minutes first. Prepare her a little. And then you follow. Mrs. Gunther? Yes, Doctor. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? Where is he? He'll be along in a minute or two. That's quite a pile of stones you've collected there. Well, these, yes. I wanted to learn how to skip them over the water, but I'm no good at it. How does he look? Older, but you'll recognize him. It's been a very long time. Yes. There he is now, coming along the beach. Is that my father? I told you he'd changed. Yes, he has. A little. More than you have. How do I look? Do I look, you know, pretty? Very pretty. That's good. I want him to like me. Catherine! That's my father. That's Daddy. Catherine, my dear! My papa. Damn him! Damn him! Get away! Get back! You're a traitor! A deserter! You're a betrayer! You're foul! You're a monster! Go back! Get up! Now put down the stones, Mrs. Get up! Go away! Go back! Go back! Go! Go! Stop it, Mrs. Dunley! You're stoning the man! Stop it! Stop it! He! 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 He left me! He went away! And he left me! When I needed him the most, I loved him and he left me. 
my father, and he left me. It's all right. It's all right. He's gone. It's all right now. I hate him. I know, I know. I want him dead. I understand. And tomorrow we'll talk it all out. Right now, let's walk back to the house. That's it. Remember what Catullus wrote? I hate and I love and I am in torment. So the final word is by a Roman poet named Catullus who lived in Sermione, a peninsula stretching out into the beautiful Italian lake called Garda. These days we speak of ambivalence and sound very learned when we do so. But the torment is the same now as it was then, in the first century before the birth of Christ. And who knows how long before that. We suspect to the start of civilization. I'll be back shortly. play is finished, and it's time to leave. In perpetuum frater ave atque vale. Those, too, are the words of Catullus, but in the original Latin, and they translate, forever, brother, hail and farewell. But we can alter them slightly for the purposes of our little show. Till the next time, brothers and sisters, hail and farewell. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Ralph Bell, Terry Keene, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>